we don't realize, but society has basically created an, another Egypt, you know, all these, I mean, I live in the Bay Area, so we're all these huge companies. I mean, you're expected to go six in the morning till nine at night and, you know, go, 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 go. There's no more thing of, no such thing as weekends anymore or vacations. And I mean, it's just crazy, like slaves to their, to their companies. Is self-love selfish or selfless? And how do we usher in the messianic era by finding that love inside of ourselves? Our guest today will be talking about this on today's show. Rabbanit Nechama Schusterman is a freelance writer, Kabbalah teacher, that's Jewish mysticism. She teaches Jewish mysticism and she's a devoted mother. She's deeply passionate about making connections between Judaism, emotional well being, and current events, which lay the foundations for her writings and her chings. You can contact her, by the way at Nechama, N-E-C-H-M-A-A, at bayareafc.org. FC is for France, California. And I want to give you a special hat tip to one of our INTR listeners, Todd M., because I didn't ask for, for permission to use his name, so it's Todd M., for suggesting this interview. So welcome to the show, uh, Rob Benitz. Thank you. Or I just want to say or whatever you prefer. Thank you. Nahama is good also. Um, okay. Just the spelling, I think it's N-E-C-H-A-M-A. -A. When you said it sounded like M-A-A. -A. So just A-M-A. -A. Okay. Clarify. All right. Yeah. We'll, we'll try to put that up also in text okay. for people. Okay. So I think that we should maybe start from a foundation of uh, you're in the Palo Alto, California area. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yes. And you are, you and your rabbi, you run a Chabad house? Yes. So okay. we run a, a, a few things. We run an organization called the Friendship Circle. That's actually why my email is Nahama at Bay Area FC. Um, and it's an organization that pairs high school students with children of special needs for recreational and social activities. And in addition, we have a Chabad house here. Yes. Okay, great. So you work with a lot of Jews who are living in the diaspora in your area specifically, who mm -hmm. did not necessarily grow up with a Jewish education. And yet, you, you so you want to make a home for them, a, a base where they can go if they have questions, you want to be able to teach them, you want to be able to build a community. And yet you're also a mother, you have children, you're a wife. Uh, so why don't we start there? Tell us all about what you do. How many kids do you have? And and your daily routine. I'm sure a lot of people are interested. How do you do all that? Thank you. It's actually interesting you're asking this because it ties very much into my journey of figuring how to balance my life is very much connected to the, to the topic today. Um, so I would say, you know, when I went out I got married at 21, um, started my, it's culturally hot, which is like, um, um, you know, um, a mission, you have a mission mission. Yeah. Um, with my husband and I was pregnant with my first baby and we went out and, you know, I had all the energy in the world, a 22 year old and going to conquer the world. Um, and initially, so we started the, the Bay area friendship circle, the organization, um, again, that I mentioned before. Um, and we were just go, go, go. I mean, you know, in the morning, I'd go to the office and do work for Friendship Circle. Um, I would give a weekly class. We always had people over big Friday night dinners and Shabbat lunch um, and, you know, every holiday program and women's evenings and um, kids programs. And over the years, you know, you do different things and some things ebb and flow, different programs like a Hebrew school for a few years and you do different things. Um, I would say I have five children, um, a girl and two boys, and then another two girls. So I feel very blessed. They're a huge part of my life. Thank God. Um, you know, in the early days, work was just, my shlichot was everything. Um, and then I was balancing my kids and my work. And I, looking back, I'm like, wow, I was always exhausted. You know, I was always 
on the go. I don't know if I had any me time, you know, it was either with my kids or in the office or hosting or on the phone. Um, but I have evolved. Um, that's why I'm very passionate actually about talking about self-love because one of the things I noticed over the years, you know, juggling kids and work was at a certain point, I was like, wow, there's no me in here. And whatever I was giving was, you know, a depleted version of me because I was an empty. So my kids were getting a depleted version. My husband was getting a depleted version. And then, you know, whatever I was giving to others, it wasn't in, in my best self. Um, so part of my journey was realizing, you know, making a shift over the past six years and recognizing that, wow, some t actually less is more, you know, because it's the quality of what we give when we're in our best self and we're nurturing ourselves and we're really emanating positive energy and, you know, we're deeply connected to ourselves and to Hashem within us, then the quality of what we're giving is so much deeper and richer and has much more impact. So my day to day now is much different than the go, go, go. I've learned that, you know, finding balance and learning how to be and nurturing myself and, you know, showing up when I can, when I'm full, I, I feel like I actually live a much more peaceful and balanced life and I'm giving more in a certain way, even though the hours are much less. Um, so I want to give an example of that, but, or I could, I mean, I think that answers that. Hmm. Okay. I don't hear you. Aaron. Sorry. Give an example. Yes. Okay. So I'm very passionate about this topic about learning to slow down and learn how to nurture ourselves because, you know, I grew up run, 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 run. And I always felt depleted um, and I'm watching the world and I'm like, wow, sometimes it looks like we're a bunch of, you know, chickens running around without heads and just trying to, you know, always accomplish more than what's humanly possible, overstimulated. So I talk about this a lot and people ask me, well, how do we know the balance, you know, because also we grew up in Judaism, give, 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 do a mitzvah, give tzedakah, help others, um, you know, love your fellow, like yourself. It's like one of the f most fundamental mitzvot, like how do we find balance? So the example that really resonates with me, you know, is imagine a teacup or you could say a kiddush cup, you know, um, and you fill it up to the top. So if you say a kiddush cup on Shabbat, you know, you fill it up to the top. And then we like to overflow it, right? Because we want abundance of a blessing. Yeah, I just want so, to say here that if or anyone that doesn't know, a kiddush cup is like a wine cup, okay? Yeah. That we make blessings. That's why I also it. like to say, you can say a tea cup also. You know, a tea cup, you pour it with tea and it's on a saucer. And then, you know, you pour it, give it a little too much water and then it overflows and the saucer is holding some of the water. So the cup is our bodies, the cup is us. And the tea that's in the in the cup is for us to fill ourselves up with joy and peace and love and abundance and whatever overflows whatever's on the saucer is for others so you could say wow well there's so little in the saucer all of that's for you but yes when you're so full whatever is overflowing on the saucer then you're giving from such a full place and in such an abundant place that whatever people receive it could be transformational for them because they're experiencing such a full, full love or full embrace or a full experience. So my day to day always includes exercising and being and resting in between and noticing my body. And when I, I don't do too much a day, like I do, you know, take on a couple things a day, make sure to have energy. Sometimes I take a nap before my kids get home. So what, you know, what is the age group of your children? Um, my oldest is 17 and my youngest is six. Okay. So I have two teenagers and then a preteen and then a nine and a six year old. Um, so yeah, I, one of the things I think I see with moms and especially, I mean, working moms, Robertson's is that they try to cram in as much work as they can before their kids get home. And then they're exhausted when their kids come home. But I see my kids are my top priority and it's, it's my work, my, you know, what Hash, where Hashem wants me to be. So if I feel overstimulated, I always try to take a nap before they come home because it's just, they need me, you know? So always trying to balance, like, what's the right amount that I still have energy for myself, my husband, my kids. I hope that answers right. that. So 
And yet, in spite of all of this, you are teaching, I understand, two Torah classes a week? Yeah. What is it in Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism? What? Give yeah. Us, give us an example of what you teach. So two different classes, one day a week um, is in person and one day a week on Zoom. Um, in person, actually, we do, it's it's on couches, so it's very, it's an intimate setting for women. Um, I, I very much believe in when I teach that, you know, again, like I said less is more. I think also with teaching, I'm, I don't I have an agenda of how much to cover. It's more about, you know, letting organic conversation come up. And sometimes if we take one concept and go deep for a whole hour, that's fine. Um, giving opportunity for the woman to explore and ask questions. I want everyone to really get it. You know, sometimes we get, we go to a Torah class and we learn for an hour and it inspires our head, but it's not integrated. And then I was like, I, I can't even really repeat it, but it sounded good. Um, I really think yeah, that- Give an example of what you're learning. I mean, Jewish yeah. systems can be things about like the soul after death, uh, yeah, you know, so like what, what exactly? Yeah, so, so my one, one class is we started, we literally started from Bereshit from the beginning of creation inside in the Chumash and we read passages in English and then one passage at a time and we discuss it. So of course, like in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. So then I'll give a Kabbalah behind that. Like, what does that mean? You know, all of a sudden there was nothing from nothing to something. And what was that process? And what does Kabbalah say about that? And then, you know, and then the last questions. And then I also believe that everything has to be brought down to our own day-to-day -day life. So, you know, for example, when we talk about creation, you know, talking about everything that was created in the world is also created in our body. Like our body is a mini world. So, you know, or when we talk about, you know, like for example, now we're in, um, told us we, Vayishlach. We just started Vayishlach. We've been doing it for quite a few years because we take it very slow. And we just finished the story of how Jacob leaves his uncle Lavan. Um, and now he's, you know, interfacing with Esav. So again, the, the battle within ourselves, you know, the struggle of like the part of us that wants to do what's right and stay connected to God, but then the other voices that pull us away and our inner daily battle. So like learning, looking inside the Chumash and then saying, how, yeah, what can the we Chumash learn? is the Torah. Okay. Yeah. Five books of Moses. And then, and then saying like, if this is here to teach us, because Torah is Torah, which means lesson. So it's all, every single word is to teach us something about ourselves and our own personal journey. So I like to teach like that and be like, what, why is this, the Torah telling us this word, this passage, what, what does this have to do? How can we become better from this experience and grow? Um, and my other class I do, um, so the Chabad Rebbe, he um, gave a discourse in, in Yiddish, it's called Sicha, or maybe it's, it's Hebrew, um, every week on that week's Torah portion. And it was very, very deep and mystical. Um, and his last year before he passed away, he spoke very much about, pretty much he gave us like, like his last will and testament or marching orders of like, I'm gonna pass away and the world's gonna be in chaos. And, you know, I know you guys are gonna need guidance of how to find the light and how to find purpose and what to do to, you know, help the world and transform. So he gave talks that are very, very much about our job right now, about, you know, transforming ourselves and finding the light in the darkness. And I'm very passionate about it. They really speak to me. So I learn them and then I give them over on Zoom. So if you can encapsulize that into a, a sentence or two, what yeah. did he want to pass on to everybody? This time in history. He passed on very, he said, essentially, there's no reason why the transformation hasn't happened yet. You could say Messiah, Mashiach hasn't happened yet. Like the world is ready. We've gone, we've done everything we can. And he said, the only thing that's left is the darkness within each one of us. That, like I said before, we're a mini world and whatever is in the world cosmically is also within us personally. So he said the world is ready, except that we we've all still carry darkness or trauma or whatever from, you know, generationally within ourselves, like suppression. And that instead of looking outside of us now, what's left is look inside of us and bring light and love into the parts of us that might feel worthless or have anxiety or fear or inhibitions and to bring God's love into those places to become free and become our whole self 
And that's going to bring the ultimate redemption because first each person needs to be redeemed within themselves. So that was his whole con consistent message his last year. Okay. So basically you're saying that people and, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, people need to do what's called a cheshbon nefesh. They have to do an accounting of their lives they have to think about where they need to improve their character defects, uh, what their mission in, mission is in this life, and to really fix themselves, what we call tikkun. And by going to this dark place in ourselves where we can bring more light in there and therefore hopefully love ourselves more, then we're able to be vessels to usher in the messianic era. Is that what you're saying? Yes, but I, I, I am. But I, what I want to clarify to the listeners is that there's a lot of times we say like tikkun olam or fixing ourselves or whatever, but we think about everything in a very intellectual way. You know, we we work with our mind. We've been very programmed that our mind is in charge and we like to think logically and we like to make sense of everything logically. But the Rebbe said that the body actually is much higher, has much higher truth and actually profits from the beginning of time. like. Yermiyahu, Jer Jeremia, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah Indian. prophesies that in the time, in the era of redemption, everything is going to switch and the, the bad is going to be good, right is going to be wrong. Right. But also specifically the prophecy that he said is that we're going to learn about God and learn about truth, th truth through our bodies and that everyone is going to become their own channel of truth, that we won't need guidance outside of ourselves because our body is going to talk to us and actually in Hebrew etzem is bone and at, in the same the same word is atzmut which is essence so according to Kabbalah that that where's God's essence you know in our head we're always like trying to make sense where's God what's God you know as we could go as far as we can with our head but there's always things we won't understand or we might go through a whole life without feeling God and we just talk about God as some sort of being but when we enter into the world of our body beyond that's higher than the brain, we actually start feeling God in our bones. It becomes a reality and we start tuning in and listening and we build this dialogue of this inner voice that's constantly communicating to us and making sense of everything. And that's how we get to real freedom because we start stop living a life of being conditioned or programmed by external voices or society or our parents or what have to or people pleasing and we start really channeling what Hashem wants from us and then that is the ultimate freedom because we're living what we were created for and it feels like flow and it feels so powerful and and freedom yes so we're now entering, we're in the nine days before the holiday of Tisha B'Av, which is the saddest day, the tragic day uh, on the Hebrew calendar. Uh, mm -hmm. And we we all want to be able to fix the, the, the sin that we had that brought us to the destruction of both temples, et cetera. And we're always praying for the third temple, which is going to be a place of worship for all of mankind as well. And we want to see the Messiah, Mashiach coming. So how do you tie in your, your um, discoveries and learning to this period, the nine days, Tisha B'Av and the coming of the Mashiach? That's a good, great question, a big question. So I don't know if this is a Chabad thing or not. I know the Rabbi always, when he, we're about to enter into the month of Av, which is the, the nine days and Tisha B'Av, and he always called the month Menachem Av, and Menachem means comfort. So is that a un, more a universal thing or is a Chabad thing? I don't know. Have I don't know, but I, I hear it a lot also. Yeah, Menachem. Okay. So Av is, I mean, of, of course, of all the 12 months, it's the time the month of most of mourning right because we have the nine days and and the, the the day of destruction which is the day of grief in the jewish calendar so on one hand it could be the most depressing month but we call it menachem of like bringing comfort to this month of darkness so you know we could look at it and say you know tisha b'av is was is a nightmare and we lost our temple and you know now we're in grief and we're in exile and life just got black and dark and you know we're so we're separated from 
Hashem and, you know, life is terrible. But the reason why we call it Menachem Av is because, you know, it's hinting to us. And Tisha B'Av also, what I want to say is, I don't see it anymore necessarily. I don't believe that we need, we should focus on it as, you know, on the destruction, but on the opportunity that the destruction is bringing an opportunity for rebuilding. And that's what the, the Rebbe's message was, is like, it's not a time to be depressed or necessarily even to grieve, but it's to think about what we can do to rebuild. Think about, I, I'm not articulating very clearly right now, so I'm going to pause and say it again, that sometimes when you are so busy and you're distracted, you don't, you're so busy that you don't even know what you're lacking. And if you don't know what you're lacking, because you're always looking to fill yourself, that you don't, you can't necessarily stop and think about what you really desire, because you're always distracting or filling yourself up. But if you pause and you think about and you're allowed and you allow yourself to feel and think about what you're lacking, from there, it could actually bring an opportunity to think about what you really desire and bring what you really want. So Tisha B'Av is a time to think about, to pause and to think about, wow, we're really not in a place that we're in our an ideal state. You know, we could get so comfortable in exile and so comfortable without the temple and without having intimacy with God and being, you know, in our light. We're just like, we make the best out of it. Like, this is life. We're anxious. You know, people are sick. We, we feel suppressed. Like, we have problems. Ah, it's life. So Tisha B'Av is a time to say, no, this is not life. This is exile and feel the lack, feel the lack so that we could feel stronger, build up the desire stronger. Because when we desire, when we know what we, that we're not in the state that we need, then it could hopefully build up passion to inspire us to kick ourselves into shape and to work towards what we really want, because we're worthy of what we really want. But we need to know that and we need to desire it. So that's Tisha B'Av. It's a time to pause and think about remember that this is not reality. This is a facade and it's an, an, it's a reality separated from God and from what we really want. Um, and what did that answer your question? I feel like you asked something else also. I, I, I think so, but I, I, I'd like to, you, you to tie in the, the bringing and enabling the opportunity for the Mashiach to come to make it the right time that God says, yeah, okay, now he's going to appear on the scene. So I think it's really important. I grew up a um, religious, observant, Chabad, learning about Mashiach, but I had a completely unreal, like non-reality visual or expectation of Mashiach. I thought like, you know, we're living in this reality and then one day, poof, like Elijah the prophet's gonna come from the clouds and blow the horn and be like, Mashiach's here. And then there's going to be this utopian reality where like, I, I don't know, we're going to become angels or something like, and I was like, I don't even know if I want that, you know, learn Torah all day, become angelic. Like it was so abstract, but the more like I've been just learning the Rebbe's talks and evolving myself, I, I am understanding the more I understand what it is, the more I desire it. And I think that's why it's important for people to understand. I, I, I hear an echo. I hear my own echo. Sounds good to no? me. Okay. People need to understand that Mashiach is the same reality. We're going to be in our physical bodies, in our actual physical homes. And I believe everyone's going to live in the same place where they are. The whole world is going to become Israel. Hashem is going to rest in the whole world. We're going to live very, very, very grounded and, and more physical than ever because we're going to be relaxed so we could actually enjoy the pleasures and the beauty of the world we're going to be able to look around and say look at the trees look at the forest look at the ocean where with the what's going to shift is is that and this is what the rabbi said it's okay in hebrew gola is exile and geula is redemption it's the same root so with the rabbi saying it's not up it's not like we're going somewhere else only difference with Gola, exile, Gola, redemption is an Aleph. And the Aleph is Hashem. So the Rebbe said, redemption is a consciousness. It's a conscious consciousness shift where you bring Hashem into your body, into the places that you've been exiled inside, where you're wounded or you feel disconnected, where you might still feel anxious or you feel in the dark. And you literally soothe yourself and bring Hashem and rewire your nervous system. And I could talk more about what that looks like practically, 
But then all of a sudden you start seeing things differently and you perceive things differently and you could go through something that normally might have triggered you or overwhelmed you or, you know, completely shut you down. And now you're like, I'm with Hashem. I'm safe. I've got this. Like you're in flow and you feel so loved and so protected and so safe and so whole that you can experience the same thing in a completely redemptive kind of way. And and that's actually what redemption is, that we're going to live in a in a very physical reality but light beings where we're full of hashem not full of suppression and confusion so life is just going to be so much better the life that we know but with love and harmony and without all the walls and disconnect and shaming and blaming and judgment that's what's going to go away and the the top the topic is self love right is it selfish or selfless so this ties in because what i believe all that's left and i'm i it's not only my belief i'm giving over the rebbe's message he said all that's left is it's not selfish it's selfless to learn to love ourselves because we can only love others as much as we love ourselves and actually the concept you have to love that's like the fundamental mitzvah right and it says that in torah we always said love your neighbor as yourself yeah love your neighbor so if you use hebrew just translate it afterwards okay so for yes. listeners who don't know yeah. yeah sorry about that so um it says that the temple was destroyed because of the opposite there was a lot of hatred and fighting between the jews and we've always i've always grown up like the opposite is what's going to rebuild the temple love your fellow like yourself what does that mean you know so we have to st- slow down love your neighbor like yourself meaning the way you like yourself is the way you're going to like your neighbors and as much as you love yourself that's how you're going to love others. And I know as a mom, you know, there before I started this journey of learning to love myself, I would think about loving them well, but then I would be like, why did I just yell? Or why did I just shame them? Or why did I just criticize them? Like, that's not what I want. But I couldn't do it any better than I was doing myself. If I was talking to myself that way, subconsciously, even in a whisper, you know, I'm going to treat my kids the way I treat myself. So the best the way if we we all envision a world right where we want the temple but we want a world where there's love and kindness and harmony and unity and everyone's acting and showing up at their their best self and we're not jealous of others we each know that we're exactly who we're supposed to be and grateful for the gifts we have and you know just a world where there's harmony and interconnectedness and people supporting each other and love the we the way we get there is by learning if everyone takes care of their own boat you know their own personal body their own selves and learns to nurture themselves and heals the part that they're lacking and and nurtures themselves then they show up to others nurtured and whole what exactly do you teach a woman you're saying that you need to love yourself but how do you actualize that to your women where they're actually they have the tools and the knowledge to actually do it. Yeah. So, I mean, week by week, we, when we talk, and that's why sometimes I just bring up one point and then we could spend an an hour with practical tools, because I do believe that I want it to be practical. So I guess, are you asking, can I give some practical examples? Yeah. I mean, people are watching this and they're hearing that we really need to love ourselves and bring that light in, in order to be able to give that light at, at, back out to other people but what's the talkless the bottom line so i'm going to give another example um because i think visuals help and then i'll try to break it down so the way i see life now the way i watch it is like imagine everyone is a cell phone right you know we all have cell phones these days and iphones and um you know at a certain point the battery starts dying and you know you have to stop and plug it in But just imagine this, that there was no such thing as a plug, but there was this like massive thing in heaven, you know, that had a battery source that if you just somehow, you know, connect like Wi-Fi tower. So it was a tower and you get battery if you connect to it. Um, But people didn't, it was, it's too hard to access or people don't know about it. So instead they're like, oh no, my battery is dying. And if there was some way to connect to another phone and, you know, share battery, so it's like, oh no, my phone's about to die. You know, I go to my husband, take some of his battery, but now he's more, his phone's more depleted. So now he's, he needs to go to a third person and get more battery and get more. 
And before we know it, everyone's running around with depleted batteries and anxious and scared because they feel like they're running out, you know? And if everyone stopped and was saying, wait, we have an infinite source up there, you know? And if we just, every time our battery goes, you just connect and you get all the battery you need. We could leave each other alone and all be whole. So, so how do you same- connect? How? Okay. So now we're going to get there. So the first thing I, 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 I want to bring up this example because it's important because okay. People, we're, when we're misguided, it's very subconscious, but when we're most depleted, we don't, we don't, we feel very uncomfortable. We don't like being depleted. We like to feel perfect and energized and, you know, f- feeling great. When we feel depleted, we feel, we might feel an edgy or tired or nervous. That's when we usually either go to other people or we might go to food or we might go to social media or TV or whatever because we're feeling uncomfortable. It's really important to know when we're depleted, our body is communicating to us and saying, I'm depleted, I'm depleted. And that's not a time to try to connect to other people or to try to give or to try to solve the problem in your head. It's a time to recharge. We need to recharge. If we're off, we need to recharge. And recharging looks different to each person. But the main thing is Hashem is in the stillness. He's always available. His love is in the stillness. He's not in the noise. You know, when we got the Torah, we got it in the desert. The desert is in a quiet space. There's a reason. Hashem is communicating. We got it with a lot of thunder and lightning. (laughs) We did get a thunder and lightning because God is also, his light is very powerful. And he, there's a lot of might and there's a lot of energy. blowing. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So when God shows up, you could feel that in your body. There's a lot of power in God's energy. Okay. Yes. But it's, but this, but where did we receive that? We received it in the desert. If you want to receive God's energy and flow and recharge, you got to be willing to slow down and go. Okay. So you're basically saying what we say in Hebrew, which is like to uh, go and uh, meditate, basically connecting with God. Uh, the, the, the still quiet voice, maybe you're talking about, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how you're referring to it, but basically it's just, really just being alone with God and, and connecting with him. So, but like, but again, I, I want to ask what you tell your woman, like a woman says, I really feel I'm depleted and I really want to know how to do it. Like, what do I do? So what so do I'll you tell her, say a few things. First of all, when I say stones, I wouldn't say can necessarily to start off that you're connecting to God. Cause that could feel abstract and it could feel maybe even impossible in the beginning when someone's starting this journey i would just say when you're noticing that you're uncomfortable irritable edgy or when you want to scream at someone or you want to you start noticing that you're trying to figure out your life those are all signs that you're exhausted so it's very hard but maybe start with five minutes and just you know or take a shower early and sit on the couch with pajamas and don't turn on the tv and just relax you know um also what would I tell someone? Um, I know I work with a lot of people who are still making lists every day and trying to follow, finish their calendar off and they have like 750 tasks every day and then they're constantly shaming themselves because they can't complete their tasks so they feel like, you know, they're a loser. And I'm like, wow, you know, you're like your own taskmaster. Actually, if if everyone stops and thinks like when we were in Egypt, we had one pharaoh Every person has their own personal pharaoh beating them up. Go, 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 go. I mean, it's not the way life is supposed to be. It's completely, we have our own personal pharaohs. So I would say to someone, if you're like, have, if you're always feeling like you can't keep up and you're exhausted, you got to redo that. Like maybe instead of 10 things a day, do four things a day. And then it's the same, it's the same way, like God said, keep the Sabbath, right? And close your business on Sabbath. And when there was many Jews that were like, that's impossible. Close on Sabbath, how, like if we rest for 24 hours, we're gonna be behind in business and we're not gonna be able to be successful. And God said, I'm the one in charge. I'm the one who gives the money. I'm the one who gives you life. I'm telling you, rest for one day a week. You're gonna be more successful. Okay, but so in that rest, it's what you're saying connecting with god because on shabbat we don't just sit there and lie down and do nothing we're uh reconnecting with god we're having a holy meal we're going to the synagogue we're studying the torah 
we are uh, reconnecting with the with our creator and forgetting about all the materialism around us and the the rat race because that's just a means to be able to keep living but what are we living for and that's what shabbat is is, is reconnecting with hashem being spiritual and and coming home so that's why i'm asking you about your women so you would tell her do do less but just do less because with that time that she's doing less things she should be doing introspective work perhaps talking to hashem asking him i need help here i need help here um i wouldn't I'm, I'm, i would oh, i want you to fill in it not me honestly i wouldn't define i'd even define it like that i think okay. that one of the things about shabbat is that hashem god made a day of rest and it's important that we see it as a day of rest and it's a day of integration it's a day to connect to god i wouldn't put rules there are certain rules we have a dinner and we have a lunch and we go to shul we go to this temple whatever we pray synagogue yeah synagogue but but i mean beyond that like the afternoon some people like to take a rest and some people like to take a walk and some people like to read and some people like to learn it's your day i mean you have to it's it's an opportunity to let go of rules so i think having daily s s sabbath you know shabbat energy it doesn't need to be defined by you need to pray or you need to do this you need to do that because then once again you're back on rules and you're back to list being energy means authentically letting go of agendas and being still and seeing what's possible because that's the only way actually we could step out of rigidness list and you know brain and getting into flow and to practice is five ten minutes a day no agenda absolutely no and ask your body what do you need maybe it'll be a walk maybe sitting on the hammock outside maybe sitting on the couch maybe taking a shower maybe reading it doesn't it's it's what do you what do you desire i would say another thing that's actually besides stillness and every slowing down, which is a must. It's really an important thing about um, to do things that we desire every every day or at least once or twice a week, because we're we don't realize, but society has basically created an, another Egypt. You know, all these. I mean, I live in the Bay Area, so. We're all these huge companies. I mean, you're expected to go six in the morning till nine at night and, you know, go, 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 go. There's no more thing of no such thing as weekends anymore or vacations. And I mean, it's just crazy, like slaves to their to their companies. And and then it's like, why, why aren't we happy? And then everyone's reading these self-help books, like how to find joy, how to find happiness. I mean, it's not going to come from a self-help book, really, because that's in your head again. It's that permission to, I, the greatest gift that I can give to the world is to do things that give me joy. Because if I bring joy to the world, that's the joy and light is the opposite of darkness and depression. If we want to solve this, we got to be the opposite. We got to do things that bring us joy and not to not pretend happiness. Like, oh, I got to be happy because I got to be perfect. We want to feel it. And that comes with doing things that we desire. I want to jump in and actually bring something from the Torah um, that c connects to this, that there's, I'll say in English, there's Moses and there's Miriam and there's Aaron, right? And the first Kohen, they're, they're brothers and sisters with each other, right? And it says that when we, the Torah says, when we got out of Egypt and we traveled through the desert, we had three different miracles and they each, of course, were in the merit of these uh, these three the three leaders so moses was the leader and in his merit we got the man every the day mana in english the mana. yeah the mana that came down and in the merit of miriam we had the well mm -hmm. and the water mm -hmm. and in the merit of our own we had the clouds of glory that protected us and surrounded us now each of these things according to kabbalah are you could go deeper because the traveling through the desert represents our own personal journey of getting out of Egypt, traveling through the desert and getting to our own personal Israel. Israel is when we're intimate with God, when we're feeling whole, when we feel free, when we're authentic selves. Egypt is when we have that taskmaster, you're not enough, you're worthless, keep going, don't stop for a second. And the desert is the traveling, is you know searching and finding ourselves. So Moses and, and the man, the mana represents working on our thinking on our head it's it's the intellect 
um, Moses is masculine and next to our head. If this is too deep and you need me to bring this down more, just tell me. But it's it's pretty profound if you think about it. They, they these three the clouds, the well, and the mana represent the three parts of us, and how how to get to a place of joy and abundance and getting to the land of Israel for our, in a personal way. So again, the mana comes from above to below, and that's our head. It's our thinking, it's our logic, and how do we heal our head? That's always how are we going to make more money and how are we going to be more successful and how are we going to? It's constantly making us crazy so what is the mana the mana came down every day and it said trust trust there's nothing you need to do just receive i will god said i will take care of you i will send down your mana every single day so when our thoughts get into anxious mode and you know overthinking and freaking out and wanting to control we we have an inner moses we have an inner moses and an inner miriam and an inner our own their energy is within us so we could tap into moses and say we have we have that love we have that you know, we're connected and we're connected to God and he's taking care of us and we could trust. So that could help us lower down our anxiety, hopefully, and breathe and remember that God is here to love us, not to fight us. He's not our enemy. He wants us to succeed. He created us to succeed and to love us. And then the well, how do we access a well? A well is deep, deep within us. And the well is Miriam, which is feminine. It's our inner, inner well. It's our inner creativity. It's our inner joy. And also Miriam, right? We know that she had the tambourines because she was in joy that even in the times of Egypt, she stayed in joy and faith the whole time. So what's that? It's that then these are daily practices, right? Daily practice of connecting to the mana, connecting to faith, connecting to our inner Moses. Every day connecting to our inner Miriam. Are we doing things that give us joy? Are we connecting to our inner self, our inner desires, our inner pleasure? Our inner, our inner trust, our inner flow and creativity. Miriam also represents okay. creativity. And then the clouds of glory is the unconditional love, right? That surrounded us and that you're safe, you're Protection, protected. Right. Yeah. And that's our body and it's our nervous system. And sometimes also people ask me, I have the voice of my heart. You, so you could say that's Miriam. I have the voice of my head, that's Moses. And they're both so strong. How do you know? So I say, oh, you need our own. Aaron is the body, is the nervous system, and it's the love that holds you and says, Shh, you're loved, you're okay, you're safe, you're protected. And then from a calm place, you'll know your truth. You'll know. You need that third encompassing energy to guide you because the body also has the highest truth. And that's how you, it's the triangle. So now let's say a person does this work and or somebody else is like in a good place they're not um they're not feeling that they're suffering that they're that they're depleted they feel they know their purpose in life they're doing it they're doing it with vigor and passion they're enjoying the ride <laughs> okay mm -hmm. um so like how is all of this now to you know to sum everything up how is this now supposed to help us bring the messiah the mashiach I would say a few reasons. Um, Mashiach is a time where, like I said, there will be no walls up. And right now the world in its dark place is it's very codependent, which means that people, there's a lot of people pleasing and trying to prove ourselves and, you know, also needing people to love us a certain way or all of that, you know, that has to, that, how can that, how can we change that? Right. Where everyone's like looking at everyone else and, in trying to compete or keep up in order to go for and the goal is to get to interdependent where everyone's like oh i'm really good at this and you're really good at that wow let's team up you don't have to don't you don't have to try so hard i'm i love this i'm great at this let me and everyone's gonna team up and you know know what they're good at and be so grateful that they're good at that so how do we make that shift from competition and trying to do everything and be everything to knowing who we are and seeing the beauty and the, and, and the wholeness in everyone is with codependence to independence, to interdependence. You need that in between. And the independence, it's, we, it's basically plugging out of the fear and the proving and the codependence and going into like a certain void in a certain way, like plugging out. And that's what I'm saying, why the self-love is the solution because plugging out of the old way, it opens up a void to receive a new plug, the source from Hashem to get filled up, not from outside, not from what we do, not from proving ourselves, not from outside validation. And we get 
a, a surge of of power and energy from the true source, which is Hashem, when we slow down and we get inside of ourselves, and then we go back to the world. The, the, the purpose is not to stay with ourselves. The purpose is to go back to the world and from abundance, then we're, we're giving. And how does that bring Mashiach? Because first of all, that's personal redemption when your source is from within your own well and from Hashem and not from outside. Because if it's outside, oh no, what if I lose that job? Or what if that person stops being my friend? Or what if that person and then and then you're even if subconsciously you're afraid but if you know if you connect to the real source you, there's nothing to be afraid of because it's consistent and it's conditional so you're calm and then from that place not only do you have personal redemption but then you go out and you know when it's, i i know like when you see someone one of the things that's hard for people to actually break patterns and transform and change is because no one really stops to see them you know, it's, and or everyone has advice. It's like, oh, I'm struggling with this. I'm, oh, try this, do this, do this. Did you try this? Like, you know, and giving all this advice, which could be shaming and judgmental. And honestly, also no one knows what's really right for someone else because each person is their own individual soul. So if someone really learns to see themselves and gives themselves that, you know, nurture, they know how to show up for someone else. And if someone's struggling, they're like, I see you, you're loved you know, Hashem loves you. He created you perfect, exactly the way you are. You're, you're loved. And they learn how to, they could pass on that soothing, loving energy to the, that which person. Which heals the world, you're saying. Which, heal, which, which, which has a ripple effect of healing because the thing is that people don't know is that trying to fix ourselves or trying to solve all our problems is not the solution because that's trying to, that's blocking Hashem out because Hashem is beyond logic, and that's trying to control our own life. Bringing Hashem in is letting go of trying to figure it out and fixing it, and bringing Hashem's energy is soothing the fact that we don't know. There's so much unknown. There's so much we don't. There's so many things we can't figure out. I think life gets so confusing. We don't have to figure it out. We just have to soothe. Yeah, I'm human. Yeah, I'm not Hashem. Hashem created me so limited. He made me in a way that I can't figure out. I don't know. I. That's hard for me. Oh my gosh. Okay. I could love myself through the discomfort. And guess what? I'm human. Woohoo. Now I just brought Hashem in and Hashem's in charge and I'm comforted and it's okay. Stop trying to be Hashem. So when we pass that on, we, we, it, it, it could have literally a transformational miracle for someone else if they're seen in that way. And they could have transformation and their transformation has a ripple effect, ripple effect, ripple effect. And the end result is that we're the feminine, God's the masculine, we're the receivers, and we don't, we stop trying to figure it out, we stop trying to be in our head, and we feel so soothed and so taken care of and so loved that we can just be the receivers and be intimate with God and let him do what was his original desire, which is create the world to adore us, cherish us, love us, give us everything we need, and for us to be in his palace with his beautiful beaches and forests and mountains and landscapes and this is our palace. He made it for us. We're his queen. And that's the end result that we feel so loved that we stop trying to be masculine and we let go because we're soothed and we could start living truth, which is that intimacy with God. That sounds very beautiful. And, uh, and if anybody, like, do you give classes on Zoom or is it only face-to-face? -face? Like if somebody wants to learn more from you or start learning once a week, would, yeah, they could email do you me offer that? I, I do one class on Zoom, yeah. Okay. On Thursday. And it's only for women, I'm assuming, or it's for men also? Um, right now it's women, but I'm open to teaching men as well. Because it's on Zoom. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Wonderful. So again, just give out your email address to everybody if someone wants to get in touch with you. Okay. It's Nechama, N-E-C-H-A-M-A, -A, Bay Area, and then FC for Friendship Circle, fc.org. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank you so much. And God willing, this should be the last Tisha B'Av of mourning and fasting. And next year, or even this year, <laughs> it yeah. should be a feasting and happiness. And uh, and there should be peace around the world. And, and we should all recognize our creator. And Amen. it should be good. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Take care. Hey everyone, to make sure you can get access to all of our interviews, make sure to hit the subscribe button on both our YouTube and Rumble channels. Your click makes us all stronger. Thanks.